Welcome back to the Children of Our Lady podcast, brought to you by the Catholic Family Podcast. My name is Thomas, and I thank you all for coming by to today's episode here on the feast day of the Assumption of Our Blessed Mother. I want to start off this episode by wishing you all a very blessed feast of the Assumption, a day of consolation. Because when we think about our Blessed Mother being assumed into heaven, as we've read in the past couple of readings from the Glories of Mary, we know that our, our Blessed Mother is there in heaven watching over us with her most powerful intercession. And this is also a day of consolation for the souls in purgatory. As we read in the Glories of Mary in the past, the Feast of the Assumption is a day where it is said that many souls are released from purgatory. And it would only make sense that on the day we celebrate our Blessed Mother's entry into heaven, that she in her goodness she would see to it that many souls were released from the terrible sufferings of purgatory. And it's a day of consolation for those who love our Blessed Mother because when we consider everything that she suffered in this life, the sacrifice that she made of her son, the constant sorrows and struggles that she faced throughout her life, living in poverty, and after having lived for quite some time separated from our Lord after he had ascended to heaven, well, it's a very nice thought to think that our Blessed Mother's sufferings had come to an end, that she was once again reunited with Jesus, and it is there in heaven where she'll always be, reunited with her Son, in the glory of the Blessed Trinity, in heaven, and trying to help us to make it to heaven, so that we may be together with her for all eternity. So in so many different ways, this is such a great and consoling day, so I hope everyone's had a great feast day thus far, and real quick, I'm sorry for not having an episode last Saturday. Last week was our parish's boys' camp, and it was definitely a very busy time. On top of that, and also power outages from some nasty weather we had, it just really wasn't convenient to get an episode in. And even though that meant having to postpone my original plan to have four consecutive episodes leading up to this feast day of the Assumption, that's not a problem, and what I think I'll do now is just kind of have a back-to-back -back post and still plan to come back with the fourth and final part of this series from the Glories of Mary on the Assumption of Our Lady, finish it up on Saturday, and return to our normal schedule. For today's episode, we move into St. Alphonsus' second discourse on the Assumption of Mary, and I must say that this reading is a very beautiful one because of how well St. Alphonsus illustrates the scene of Our Lady arriving in heaven. It's something that I definitely found very moving, and I hope you all do as well. And with things still being pretty busy on my end, and with this reading really not needing any extra commentary from me, I'm going to do what I've done a few times in the past and just end the episode with the reading, and just leave you all with what St. Alphonsus says here in this really beautiful discourse. But a couple of things that I wanted to say now, because I won't be doing any commentary after this reading, is I hope that anyone who did watch the last episode of the Children of Our Lady podcast and listened to the commentary, for anyone who may have undertaken the resolution with me, I hope we can all persevere in striving to make better use of ejaculatory prayers in a spirit of reparation, especially in this month of August, the month of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Just simply saying, Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. Constantly invoking Jesus and Mary in a spirit of love, and reparation, and also aiding ourselves by keeping ourselves in the presence of Jesus and Mary throughout the day, helping us to stay better recollected. But I hope that we can all undertake this together and strive to make this month of August a month of reparation because there are so many offenses being committed daily and some very terrible ones, even on a public stage, that we have to do our part to make reparation for. So I encourage everyone to continue to do so, and, and even if it's not with those specific ejaculatory prayers, whatever ones you may feel particularly called to. But I guess the point of why I bring all of that up is just merely to encourage a simple yet effective form of reparation. And the last thing I want to say before we move into the reading today, I'm sorry that this intro is probably going on a little bit longer, but one of the reasons I was most upset about missing last week's episode was just because it was the same weekend that we celebrated the feast day of St. Philomena. Now, I'm sure she's a dear friend for all of you. She's a dear friend of mine. And I couldn't let St. Philomena's feast day pass by here on the Children of Our Lady podcast without at least acknowledging it and encouraging devotion to her. Because as most of us know, she is the patroness of a lot of things. But she is the patroness of the Children of Mary. And when we consider her under that title, 
It is no wonder that Satan wanted her removed from Catholic calendars, wanted devotion to her to be forgotten about. And that's precisely why we should cling to devotion to St. Philomena and strive to encourage that devotion in others, because she is a very powerful advocate, a very powerful intercessor with God, and a saint who's an inspiration to all of us when we think about her story, all that she suffered at such a young age, the courage that she had to stand up for her faith, to stand up for her virtue, even to death. And, like I mentioned before, as St. Alphonsus is sort of like the patron here of the Children of Our Lady podcast, well, the patroness of the Children of Mary, what better patroness could you have for the Children of Our Lady podcast? And so I'll happily take St. Philomena as a special patroness for this podcast. But there's a lot more that can be said about St. Philomena and about reparation and about the Feast of the Assumption, But I know this intro has gone on quite a bit, so I think we'll wrap it up here and move into our reading of part one of this second discourse from St. Alphonsus on the Assumption of Our Blessed Mother. And, God willingly, I'll see you all on Saturday. God bless you all, and Mary keep you. Discourse 8. Second Discourse on the Assumption of Mary. First, how glorious was the triumph of Mary when she ascended to heaven. Second, how exalted was the throne to which she was elevated in heaven. It would seem right that on this day of the assumption of Mary to heaven, the Holy Church should rather invite us to mourn than to rejoice, since our sweet mother has quitted this world and left us deprived of her sweet presence. As St. Bernard says, it seems that we should rather weep than rejoice. But no, the Holy Church invites us to rejoice. Let us all rejoice in the Lord, celebrating a festival in honor of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And justly, for if we love our mother, we ought to congratulate ourselves more upon her glory than on our own private consolation. What son does not rejoice, though on account of it he has to be separated from his mother, if he knows that she is going to take possession of a kingdom? Mary on this day is crowned Queen of Heaven, and shall we not keep it a festival and rejoice if we truly love her? Let us rejoice, then, let us all rejoice. And that we may rejoice and be consoled the more by her exaltation, let us consider, first, how glorious was the triumph of Mary when she ascended to heaven, and, secondly, how glorious was the throne to which she was there exalted. First Point After Jesus Christ our Savior had completed by his death the work of redemption, the angels ardently desired to possess him in their heavenly country. Hence they were continually supplicating him in the words of David, Arise, O Lord, into thy resting place, thou and the ark which thou hast sanctified. Come, O Lord, come quickly, now that thou hast redeemed men. Come to thy kingdom and dwell with us, and bring with thee the living ark of thy sanctification, thy mother, who was the ark which thou didst sanctify by dwelling in her womb. Precisely thus does St. Bernadine make the angel say, Let thy most holy mother Mary, sanctified by thy conception, also ascend. Our Lord was, therefore, at length pleased to satisfy the desire of these heavenly citizens by calling Mary to paradise. But if it was his will that the ark of the old dispensation should be brought with great pomp into the city of David, and David and all the house of Israel brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord with joyful shouting and with sound of trumpet, With how much greater and more glorious pomp did he ordain that his mother should enter heaven? The prophet Elias was carried to heaven in a fiery chariot, which, according to interpreters, was no other than a group of angels who bore him off from the earth. But to conduct thee to heaven, O mother of God, says the abbot Rupert, a fiery chariot was not enough. The whole court of heaven, headed by its king, thy son, went forth to meet and accompany thee. St. Bernardine of Siena is of the same opinion. He says that Jesus, to honor the triumph of his most sweet mother, went forth in his glory to meet and accompany her. St. Anselm also says that it was precisely for this purpose that the Redeemer was pleased to ascend to heaven before his mother. That is, he did so not only to prepare a throne for her in that kingdom, but also that he might himself accompany her with all the blessed spirits, and thus render her entry into heaven more glorious and such as become one who was his mother. Hence, St. Peter Damien, contemplating the splendor of this assumption of Mary into heaven, says that we shall find it more glorious than the ascension of Jesus Christ, for to meet the Redeemer, angels only went forth. But when the Blessed Virgin was assumed to glory, 
she was met and accompanied by the Lord himself of glory, and by the whole blessed company of saints and angels. For this reason, the abbot Guarich supposes the divine word thus speaking. To honor the Father, I descended from heaven. To honor my mother, I reascended there. That thus I might be enabled to go forth to meet her, and myself accompany her to paradise. Let us now consider how our Savior went forth from heaven to meet his mother. On first meeting her and to console her, he said, Arise, make haste, my love, my dove, my beautiful one, and come, for winter is now past and gone. Come, my own dear mother, my pure and beautiful dove, leave that valley of tears in which, for my love, thou hast suffered so much. Come from Libanus, my spouse, come from Libanus, come, thou shalt be crowned. Come in soul and body, to enjoy the recompense of thy holy life. If thy sufferings have been great on earth, far greater is the glory which I have prepared for thee in heaven. Enter, then, that kingdom, and take thy seat near me. Come to receive that crown which I will bestow upon thee as queen of the universe. Behold, Mary already leaves the earth, at which she looks with affection and compassion. With affection, remembering the many graces she had there received from her Lord, and with affection and compassion, because in it she leaves so many poor children surrounded with miseries and dangers. But see, Jesus offers her his hand, and the Blessed Mother already ascends. Already she has passed beyond the clouds, beyond the spheres. Behold her already at the gates of heaven. When monarchs make their solemn entry into their kingdoms, they do not pass through the gates of the capital, for they are removed to make way for them on this occasion. Hence, when Jesus Christ entered paradise, the angels cried out, Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, O eternal gates, and the King of glory shall enter in. Thus also, now that Mary goes to take possession of the kingdom of heaven, the angels who accompany her cry out to those within, Lift up your gates, O ye princes, and be ye lifted up, O eternal gates, and the Queen of glory shall enter in. Behold, Mary already enters that blessed country. But on her entrance, the celestial spirits, seeing her so beautiful and glorious, ask the angels without, as Origen supposes it, with united voices of exaltation, Who is this that cometh up from the desert, flowing with delights, leaning upon her beloved? And who can this creature so beautiful be that comes from the desert of the earth, a place of thorns and tribulation? But this one comes pure and rich in virtue, leaning on her beloved Lord, who is graciously pleased himself to accompany her with so great honor. Who is she? The angels accompanying her answer. She is the mother of our king. She is our queen and the blessed one among women, full of grace, the saint of saints, the beloved of God, the immaculate one, the dove, the fairest of all creatures. Then all the blessed spirits begin to bless and praise her, singing with far more reason than the Hebrews did to Judith, Thou art the glory of Jerusalem, thou art the joy of Israel, thou art the honor of our people. Ah, our Lady and our Queen, thou then art the glory of paradise, the joy of our country, thou art the honor of us all. Be thou ever welcome, be thou ever blessed, behold thy kingdom. Behold us also who are thy servants, ever ready to obey thy commands. All the saints who were in paradise then came to welcome her and salute her as their queen. All the holy virgins came. The daughters saw her and declared her most blessed, and they praised her. We, they said, O most blessed lady, are also queens in this kingdom, but thou art our queen, for thou wast the first to give us the great example of consecrating our virginity to God. We all bless and thank thee for it. Then came the holy confessors to salute her as their mistress who, by her holy life, had taught them so many beautiful virtues. The holy martyrs also came to salute her as their queen, for she, by her great constancy in the sorrows of her son's passion, had taught them, and also by her merits had obtained them strength, to lay down their lives for the faith. St. James, the only one of the apostles who was yet in heaven, also came to thank her in the name of all the other apostles, for all the comfort and help she had afforded them while she was on earth. The prophets next came to salute her, and said, Ah, lady, thou wast the one foreshadowed in our prophecies. The holy patriarchs then came, and said, O Mary, it is thou who wast our hope. 
for thee it was that we sighed with such ardor and for so long a time. But amongst these latter came our first parents, Adam and Eve, to thank her with still greater affection. Ah, beloved daughter, they said, thou hast repaired the injury which we inflicted on the human race. Thou hast obtained for the world that blessing which we lost by our crime. By thee we are saved, and for it be ever blessed. St. Simeon then came to kiss her feet, and with joy reminded her of the day when he received the infant Jesus from her hands. St. Zachary and St. Elizabeth also came, and again thanked her for that loving visit which, with such great humility and charity, she had paid them in their dwelling, and by which they had received such treasures of grace. St. John the Baptist came with still greater affection to thank her for having sanctified him by her voice. But how must her holy parents, St. Jochum and St. Anne, have spoken when they came to salute her? O oh God, with what tenderness must they have blessed her, saying, Ah, beloved daughter, what a favor it was for us to have such a child. Be thou now our queen, for thou art the mother of our God, and as such we salute and adore thee. But who can ever form an idea of the affection with which her dear spouse, St. Joseph, came to salute her? Who can ever describe the joy which the Holy Patriarch felt at seeing his spouse so triumphantly enter heaven and made queen of paradise? With what tenderness must he have addressed her? Ah, my lady and spouse, how can I ever thank our God as I ought for having made me thy spouse, thou who art his true mother? Through thee I merited to assist on earth the childhood of the eternal word, to carry him so often in my arms, and to receive so many special graces. Ever blessed be those moments which I spent in life in serving Jesus and thee, my holy spouse. Behold our Jesus. Let us rejoice that now he no longer lies on straw in a manger, as we saw him at his birth in Bethlehem. He no longer lives poor and despised in a shop, as he once lived with us in Nazareth. He is no longer nailed to an infamous gibbet, as when he died in Jerusalem for the salvation of the world. But he is seated at the right hand of his Father, as King and Lord of heaven and earth. And now, O my Queen, we shall never more be separated from his feet. We shall there bless him and love him for all eternity. All the angels then came to salute her, and she, the great Queen, thanked all for the assistance they had given her on earth, and more especially she thanked the archangel Gabriel, who was the happy ambassador, the bearer of all her glories, when he came to announce to her that she was the chosen mother of God. The humble and holy virgin, then kneeling, adored the divine majesty, and, all absorbed in the consciousness of her own nothingness, thanked him for all the graces bestowed upon her by his pure goodness, and especially for having made her the mother of the eternal word. And then, let him who can, comprehend with what love the most holy trinity blessed her. Let him comprehend the welcome given to his daughter by the Eternal Father, to his mother by the Son, to his spouse by the Holy Ghost. The Father crowned her by imparting his power to her, the Son his wisdom, the Holy Ghost his love, and the three divine persons, placing her throne at the right of that of Jesus, declared her sovereign of heaven and earth, and commanded the angels and all creatures to acknowledge her as their queen, and as such to serve and obey her. <laughs>